Hello and welcome to a tactical history of Liverpool. Despite only finishing 7th the season before, Bill Shankly chose not to bolster the squad over the summer of 1965, with John Ogston, a backup goalkeeper who would make just one appearance for the Reds, the only new signing. FA Cup victory and a strong European Cup campaign convinced the Scott that the poor league showing had been an aberration caused by fatigue from their American tour. Liverpool made a solid start to the 65-66 season, they won seven of their first 13 league matches, most notably thrashing Everton 5-0 in the Merseyside derby, but also lost four. Things began to click for the Reds as autumn turned into winter though. From late October to today's match at the start of December, Liverpool went unbeaten, winning five and drawing one to go top of the football league. Their opponents for the day were Chelsea. Like Liverpool, Chelsea were managed by a Scott, Shankly's friend Tommy Doherty. It was Doherty that Preston signed to replace Shankly at right half, and Shankly got in touch with his compatriot to congratulate him, telling him, just put the shirt on and let it run around, it knows where to go. After nearly a decade at Preston, Doherty moved on to Arsenal, and with his playing days winding down, began to prepare for the next stage of his career by coaching Barnett two nights a week, before being drawn to Chelsea by a player coach role. Chelsea had won their first league title in 1955 under the management of Ted Drake, but by the time Doherty joined in 1961, they were very much on the wane. After winning the league, the highest Chelsea would finish under Drake was 11th, so chairman Joe Mears began searching for a coach to work alongside the manager to shake the side out of its complacency. Within a year, Doherty would be made manager as Chelsea headed towards relegation. The goals of Jimmy Greaves had propped up Chelsea in mid-table, but his departure for AC Milan saw Chelsea collapse. The dock was unable to avoid the drop, finishing rock bottom, but he rebuilt the team in the second division. You sold a lot of players. Yeah, <clears throat> I sold a lot and we gave a lot away as well because they weren't good enough. And uh, really, that's basically what was wrong. We, it was a team getting old together and they needed replacing. And we had the team at the bridge. We had a lot of kids at the bridge at the time just waiting to get the person to get into the first team. And I realised that I had to get a breath of fresh air into the club by bringing the kids through and giving them a chance. Chelsea's senior side may have had little success since their league win, but their youngsters looked promising winning the FA Youth Cup in 1960 and 1961. Doherty put his trust in these young players. Goalkeeper Reg Matthews was replaced by Peter Bonetti. Brothers Peter and John Sillett were replaced at fullback by Alan Harris and Ken Shalito, while Ron Harris was introduced in defence. In midfield, a teenage Terry Venables was earning comparisons to Duncan Edwards, but Murray was providing crosses from the wing, while up front Bobby Tambling and Barry Bridges were scoring goals. With the help of innovative young coach Dave Sexton, Doherty introduced a style of play to match his players' youthful exuberance. He had played under Jimmy Hogan, the godfather of possession football, at Celtic, and the experience clearly rubbed off on him. He used to say football was like a Viennese waltz, Doherty said, a rhapsody. One, two, three, one, two, three, pass, move, pass, pass, move, pass. We were sat there, glued to our seats because we were so keen to learn. His arrival at Celtic Park was the best thing that ever happened to me. Chelsea played slick counter-attacking football with Bonetti taught to throw the ball out to his teammates rather than punting it forward as most goalkeepers did. Although the widespread adoption of the back four, covered in episode two, meant various teams started using overlapping fullbacks during this period, Doherty is the man typically credited with introducing it to English football. The Doc would regularly go abroad to learn new tricks, with the attacking fullbacks apparently an idea from a trip to see Real Madrid. I picked up their tactic of players overlapping in attack, Doherty said. At Real, it was only the forwards that did it. I extended it at Chelsea to the backs and half-backs. The young team was dubbed Doherty's Little Diamonds and returned to the first division at their first attempt. They would then finish fifth in their first season back at the highest level, before winning the League Cup and mounting a title challenge in 64-65. Here we are catching Chelsea on the slide, though, with an incident at the tail end of that title charge to blame. With three games left to play, Chelsea was sitting atop the Football League, However, all three of those remaining games were away from home in the northwest. Rather than waste time and energy travelling to and from London, Chelsea instead set up a training base in Blackpool. They kicked off a run-in with a 2-0 loss to Liverpool, and Doherty was not best pleased. He originally planned on giving the squad a night off after the Liverpool game, but opted to cancel it after the poor result. Not wanting to stay cooped up in a hotel, eight Chelsea players disobeyed Doherty's orders and went out for a few drinks anyway. Upon their return to the hotel, they were confronted by a furious Doherty, who sent them all home on the first train back to London the following morning. He later told reporters, I lay down the rules and if the players break them, they must take the consequences. Fielding eight reserves to replace the players he had sent home, Chelsea lost 6-2 to Burnley in their next match. The title challenge was dead and buried, 
losing the final match against Blackpool 2, Chelsea would finish third. If Doherty felt betrayed by his players, then the feeling was mutual. I still find it hard to believe, said Terry Venables. He chose to humiliate us and embarrass our families. It was the big football scandal of the year. He chose to turn a small storm that could have easily been dealt with in-house into a full-blown tornado. It was hugely costly to Chelsea. Doherty was never one to shy away from publicity, and in some ways it benefited him, able to talk himself into jobs. However, this was the downside. A more experienced or less showy manager may have dealt with the matter privately, yet Doherty felt the need to make a large public spectacle of disciplining his players, throwing away any chance of winning the league. Not only that, but he actively inflamed the situation by leaking the news to the media. When we arrived back in London, the world's press were waiting for us, remembered Venables. Years later, people still asked me about it. I can't forget what the doc did to us or work out why he did it. In my opinion, it was crass, stupid and self-defeating. I must admit that I was too much of a sergeant major. I was far too strict in hindsight now. None of the guilty players would depart that summer, but their relationship with their manager had completely soured. Doherty had clearly put together a side capable of challenging for honours, however now they hated him. Of the eight players sent home from Blackpool, six would start in this game against Liverpool. Doherty's trust in youth was on full display as Chelsea hosted the Reds. Liverpool boasted a young team themselves with an average age of just 25.4, yet Chelsea's average age was only 21.8. Early in the season, Doherty had dropped main goal scorer Barry Bridges, himself just 24, in favour of 18-year-old Peter Osgood. This was also the debut of 22-year-old winger Tommy Robson, signed from newly promoted Northampton Town. Chelsea sat in 10th place coming into the game, albeit with two games in hand. Gordon Milne was the only missing man from Liverpool's strongest lineup. Milne's horrible knee injury that ruled him out of the FA Cup final had come against Chelsea in April, and he continued to be plagued by problems. He had already missed all of October, and this current injury would keep him out until after Christmas. The midfielder was replaced by Jeff Strong. Chelsea would typically play defensively away from home, pulling 9 or 10 men back behind the ball, and looking to catch up the opposition on the counter-attack reserving their more open attacking play for home games. They were enduring a miserable season at Stamford Bridge though, winning just two of their eight home league matches so far, whereas they had won six of their nine away games. Going up against table-topping Liverpool, they instead opted to use their away tactics at home, dragging most of the team back into defence then breaking at speed. There is a chance that this was the players themselves making changes rather than any strategy from Doherty though. There were constant murmurs that Chelsea players weren't following his game plans, and Venables confirmed it in his autobiography. We did change things on the field if we thought that was necessary. I never considered it open defiance, but a sensible response to the situation we were faced with. After all, isn't that what good players are supposed to do? Adapt to the circumstances? One particular example he gives is of a match against Roma at the start of this season. Bernard Joy, who had access to our dressing room, said to the doc, Tom, go for them. You have to. We fought the opposite and believed we should play with a sweeper, keeping things really tight. After all, we had a free goal lead. We also had Marvin Hinton, who was superb in that role, but the doc decided we would play a normal game because of our lead. We knew that if the Roma players were caught up in the hostile atmosphere created by the crowd, we could find ourselves in trouble. So we agreed among ourselves that Marvin should play a little deeper, like a sweeper, when the pressure was on. I'm sure that the doc must have seen what we were doing, but because it had worked, he decided to say nothing about it. Given this Roma match took place just two months prior to the Liverpool one, it's not beyond the realm of possibility that Chelsea's players were disobeying Doherty's orders again by opting to use their more defensive away strategy, although equally possible was that Doherty changed his tactics of his own accord. On paper, Chelsea's shape could easily be seen as a 4-2-4 just like Liverpool's, but in practice it was frequently more like a 5-4-1. As well as pulling back their attackers to defend, Chelsea would man mark. Ron Harris on Peter Thompson, Eddie McCready on Ian Callaghan, John Boyle on Roger Hunt and John Hollins on Ian St. John, with Martin Hinton the spare man like a sweeper. Hollins was nominally a midfielder, but as his defensive position was defined by where St. John was, it could often resemble a back five, with Hollins either in midfield when St. John dropped off, or in defence when the Scott remained forward. George Graham would start further forward with the midfielders, but would regularly drop back to join them too. This approach served Chelsea well early on. With lots of men back, they were solid defensively, and then they would spring forward on the counter-attack, catching out Liverpool. Quick, neat exchanges of passes allowed Chelsea to get at Liverpool, while Robson was threatening down the left, requiring Liverpool to bring him down with fouls on several occasions. It was young Peter Osgood that stood out, though. His excellent close control allowed him to evade opposition challenges, while he frequently dropped off the front line to receive the ball, drawing out Liverpool defenders to create a gap for his teammates. His early successes for Chelsea gradually faded away, though. This was partly due to the state of the pitch. 
Chelsea were at their best early on when they could move the ball quickly. But the longer the game went on, the boggier the pitch became, slowing down how quickly the ball and the players could move. With the rain lashing down in the second half, this only worsened and Liverpool were in complete control. It wasn't just the pitch though. Liverpool's fouling helped to break up the play. They may have been giving away free kicks, but at least it gave the opportunity to slow down Chelsea's attacks and get men back. Chelsea weren't helping themselves either though. Graham would drop off into midfield, as would Osgood, meaning Chelsea was sometimes left without anyone leading the line. Or Joe Fascioni in particular, but also Robson as the game went on, began to come inside rather than staying out on the flanks. Chelsea's best moments came when they played at speed while stretching the Liverpool back line. Now they were slowing down while choosing to funnel themselves through the centre, making it easy for Liverpool to smother them. With Chelsea fading, a patient Liverpool took control. As previously mentioned, Chelsea and Liverpool may have had nominally matching formations, but in reality there was a big difference. Hollins was getting dragged back following St. John, so he could easily be considered a defender as much as a midfielder, whereas Venables, Chelsea's main creative force, would frequently push forward to join the attack when Chelsea were in possession. This meant that when Chelsea lost the ball, there wasn't really anyone covering the large gap between the two. Hollins would get pulled back into defence, Venables would get pulled forward into attack, leaving a massive hole in the midfield. Liverpool's way of playing was perfect for exploiting this. Willie Stevenson was happy to simply stride forward and the ball through the space in the centre, or St. John would drop off into midfield and Callaghan would tuck inside. Perhaps most important was Tommy Smith's willingness to step up into midfield though. Even if Hollins and Venables were both in position in midfield, having Smith join Strong and Stevenson allowed Liverpool to outnumber Chelsea and play through them. From the off, Liverpool were happy to manipulate Chelsea's man marking too. Thompson would drop deep, pulling Harris up the pitch to open up a gap for a teammate. While, as usual, the winger would tuck inside into the centre too, dragging Harris far away from his proper position. Likewise, Callaghan would come in field, and St. John would drop off, with Hunt happy to attack whatever gaps they left. Rather than remaining static, Liverpool's attackers kept moving, causing Chelsea's defenders to get dragged across the pitch following them. Now, Liverpool did score through Hunt, but unfortunately we don't have any footage of the goal, as some genius at the BBC decided to edit it out post-broadcast. This sudden cut is what we have in its place. Even if a goal had been left in, this broadcast would have still been a horror show, however. The quality of the pitch is poor throughout, but gets much worse in the second half as the rain begins to lash down harder. The only reason I'm able to analyse the game at all is thanks to extensive colour correction. This is the original footage, far too dark to make out what's going on. As someone trying to track a football club's development over half a century after the fact, the advent of colour television can't come soon enough. So unfortunately we don't know how exactly Liverpool took the lead, but we know they did. Tasked with breaking down a tough defensive shell and quelling a dangerous counter-attacking threat, Liverpool remained patient and were eventually rewarded for it. It might not have been a dazzling performance from them, but it was a mature and intelligent one. After taking the lead, they continued to threaten, but more importantly sought to maintain control, and afraid to simply hold on to possession and see the game out. With another two points, Liverpool were starting to pull away at the top of the first division even before Christmas. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe to support the channel. You can get updates on what I'm doing by following on Twitter and Facebook, links are in the description, but most importantly by supporting Holding Me Field on Patreon. Without financial support, I can't justify the time it goes into making these videos to keep the channel alive while also receiving access to premium content. Thanks for watching.